Hi, this is Scott Park Phillips, and I, uh, we are really lucky today to have Professor Mark Muhlenbeld joining us from Hong Kong. And uh, he is one of the most important scholars in the world today in, in the, on the issues of uh, the relationship between what has historically been called Chinese literature and ritual and religion. And uh, one of the things I really love about your work, Mark, is it okay to call you Mark? Of course. Of yeah, course. okay. <laughs> one of the things I really love about your contribution to the field is that you have been uh, really taking the time to, to explain that there really was no secular Chinese world, that, that the Chinese world it is embedded with religion and that the habit in the last 120 years or so of describing things in the past in an, either a narrow religious or a narrow martial arts or a narrow um, literary um, concept or even narrow military concept is actually um, a, a misleading because everything was embedded in religion. So I'm gonna jump right into a big question why don't you tell us what a Chinese militia is or was? <laughs> okay, well, uh, first of all, thanks for inviting me uh, and uh, for, uh, for giving me a, a chance to, uh, to have this talk. That's very nice. Um, and of course, I have to object against you calling me one of the most important people in uh, uh, in any way. Uh, luckily, you 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 qualified it by saying the the field of literature, uh, religion, and literature, which is basically a tiny field. So okay. <laughs> um, um, yeah. No, I think that's a really uh, before before talking about militia. So let me first say that I, I think the the way you you uh, frame it you know, about uh, the secular and the religious, I think that's very, that's very important to me. Um, not just in that, uh, I, I do believe that most Chinese traditional uh, phenomena or the Chinese traditional world is embedded in what we now would call uh, a religious, uh, religious fear. So that, that's the, the first thing. Um, of course, you know, as you know very well yourself, the, the term religion is itself a, a, a Christian modern concept. So that's also limiting. But other than the, the whole discussion about uh, secular and religious, um, I, I would like to add that it's, it's, it's not just about that, but also uh, what I really attach value to. You, you sort of mentioned it by, by listing these things, martial arts, uh, literature, etc. It's really about these categories that we uh, have grown used to to work with and to uh, as as kind of uh, perspectives or, or lenses that we view the world. So most people, when they look at uh, at martial arts, they see martial arts. When they look at uh, a novel like uh, the Ming Dynasty novels that that uh, that I'm that I've been working on, they see novels. Um, when people talk about religion, they think that it is also something that is a limited, uh, limited sphere. So clearly, that's something that uh, we 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 uh, we agree on. These things, these categories, are limiting, and they sort of they block out a lot of a lot of the connections that are uh, important uh, and uh, that are just there uh, for people in their everyday lives. Okay, so that that's something that I, I'm I'm very happy that that you uh, you you frame this. So to answer the question, what is a militia? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> um, uh, I, I know one thing, which is very clearly in, in the old days, let's say maybe up until, uh, maybe up until the, nine, the, 19, the, early, the early 20th century, uh, it was very common for, I, actually, no, I have, to, I have to rephrase it. I, I think uh, even during, the time that uh, the communist party, the communist movement was conquering China, uh, they made use of militia. Uh, I, I remember very distinctly that uh, in Fujian, for example, the Red 
army uh, made use of, uh, of local militias who were basically uh, you know, in every village, in every region. Uh, and there were mechanisms for mobilizing these militias uh, uh, and, and, and basically appeal to them to help overthrow uh, you know, the, the powers that be at that, at that moment. So, so these, were, um, these were groups of people who basically were villagers or however you want to call them, and uh, they would practice martial arts uh, in whatever way you want to, uh, to explain that. Um, they would practice those martial arts together. Um, I think it's hard, it's hard to be sure of this, but I think usually uh, it would be in the context of, of festivals only. I, I, I imagine there, there would not be uh, something as leisurely uh, uh, available as, as uh, practicing together on a daily basis, but I don't know, uh, I don't know. But anyway, so these people, they were, they were I think for sure, they would practice these things uh, during, uh, during festivals and maybe leading up to festivals, they would practice together, right? Um, which is on the one hand, a service in, uh, well, a service dedicated to a local God in a temple, right? So these groups would, perceive themselves as serving a local god uh, and they might be representing the powers of that god or the the demon minions of that god um, on the one hand on the other hand they would also uh, see themselves as representing their neighborhood uh, or their village or uh, their region whatever uh, however you know geographically or locally they would see themselves uh, and, and serve their community, protecting them. So they would practice these martial arts to be able to ward off dangers from uh, invading militaries, but mostly actually for bandits. I mean, this is something I've been looking into recently, uh, especially in the province of Hunan, where, where I do a lot of research. It turns out yeah. there was a lot of banditry, a lot of banditry. And uh, so these local militias, they were very important to protect people against uh, you know, these these ro roaming, roving armies of, of or gangs of of, uh, of, 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 of of gangsters, basically, who try to um, to loot and, and and ransack villages. So that that's very important uh, for those um, militias. So I, I I should tell you, uh, you know, I've done some interviews with various people. I did a, a wonderful interview with a a, a, a graduate student. Uh, uh, Peng Yu Jiao, who is uh, who managed to, to leave, um, uh, get into the archives, communist archives, um, where they had uh, interrogations of um, martial artists, thousands of martial artists who were executed um, in the early fifties uh, in in uh, or in the area okay, around Wuhan, and they, they, these are their interrogations before execution. And they were all part of these, what were described as martial cults. They usually um, involved the, the, some bodhisattva uh, that, that, that empowered them with invulnerability. Uh, and they also, um, uh, and, and they're usually led by a, a master, what I, would, what I would characterize as a magician, you know, as a, 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 um, a religious magician of sorts who would convince them that this was a great that you know and and these were these were lar they largely organized these militias for fighting bandits as well um and he documents that it was a really interesting talk uh, another thing i would i that i think i've discussed with people before is is uh, elizabeth perry describes right. the, the red spears and she she has a foot one footnote where she says most of these they have they're not all called red spears they're called all different things most of them seem to be organized around feng shen yani which is oh really yeah oh, yeah oh, that's great. That's yeah great. she had a footnote like that and and of course this is your major subject what are the five camps and what does it have to do with five function yani can I ask you first which which uh, which, which work book? is it that you read that oh. in Paris uh, I'll I'll have to send you a note I can't remember I it's okay, in my sure, book sure, sure, sure. it's in my book it's 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 in there okay um. All right, so uh, what are the five camps or uh, five encampments or uh, five armies? There's different ways, different translations. You know, it, it, it's the, the term Wu Ying uh, in, in Chinese. So 
<clears throat> that is basically if you if you think about the way in which traditional Chinese people would would situate themselves in the world um, in a way like all of us we are always the center of our world uh, and in a way that is also how traditional Chinese people would uh, situate themselves with the exception that they would attach to that also uh, a whole cosmology in which they fit. So in traditional China, of course, uh, there is uh, an idea of the cosmos where you are um, located in, uh, in a square that is the earth uh, and you are, you are covered by a dome or a sphere uh, that is heaven. So there, that's why, you know, they say Tianyuan uh, Tifang, which means heaven is round, uh, heaven, uh, earth is square. And that square uh, is traditionally, well, traditionally, you know, uh, I, I think the earliest we can, we can ascertain this is about uh, a few centuries before the common era. So that, that square would be divided into nine uh, smaller squares. So you would have uh, three, three. Now, the, the dome of, uh, of heaven uh, would only completely cover five squares. Uh, so the, the, four, uh, the four corners would not be completely covered. So they, they would be uh, sort of, you know, terra incognita. They would be sort of uh, uh, the dark edges of the world and would not be included in uh, what the Chinese thought, uh, you know, schematically as the civilized world, as, as the the cultured world. So there would be an idea that only five of these squares uh, were civilized. Uh, and of course, the one in the center, which is where, where the Chinese are, is the most civilized. Um, and <clears throat> in fact, um, there would be, I mean, I, I mean, of course, you know all this, but uh, there would be different uh, 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 animals attached or mythical animals attached to each of these squares. They would also be understood as protecting the central uh, yellow uh, square. So when people talk about the, the five camps, they would always make sure that that kind of blueprint of cosmology would be uh, projected onto their own living space and villages would have, uh, this is still the case in, in, in Taiwan, um, villages would have small shrines uh, on the five cardinal points, north, east, south, west, uh, around their most important temple, which would be at the center uh, or another central point in the village, uh, where there would be the fifth and, and central shrine. So these would demarcate basically uh, the, 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 the sacred precinct that is protected by the five camps or the five armies uh, of that particular village. And the same is true for, for, for a temple, would also have that kind of uh, a smaller version of it uh, where you have the five camps protecting a temple. And of course also uh, would be much bigger, like the whole uh, dynasty would be protected by uh, the five camps. And in fact, you know, you know in, in Chinese uh, traditional lore, there is the, uh, the five sacred peaks or the five sacred mountains. Uh, these are basically the anchor points of the, uh, the five, uh, of the five uh, um, sacred, uh, the five sacred uh, squares, if you want to call it that. Um, so, I, you know, it, it's, yeah. I recently showed um, on a, in a, a video the uh, 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 um, armor, which presumably is from Korea, where they show the, the, the five mountains on the armor itself as oh, that's great. protectors. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty cool. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, so this, I realize this is a very complicated subject and you've done such a wonderful job in your writing and, and I don't, I think people should read your books. <laughs> that's what I really- Thank you, think. thank you. Thank um, you. And your papers and, and, and but I wanted to try and get at a little bit that just the, the maybe the overview of of Feng Shen Yani and how how it I mean, maybe can you do that? Can you do that in a short period of time? Can describe the overview of Feng Shen Yani and, it, and how it connects to militia creation? Um, <clears throat> well, that's a uh, that's not an easy task. Um, no. So Feng Shen Yani. Uh, 
what we have come accustomed to calling a, a novel from the Ming dynasty, but I prefer to call it uh, just a, a narrative. So a narrative in the vernacular language of, uh, of the Ming dynasty. And uh, so this was a book that was part of, uh, uh, you know, several other, well, let, let's say a generation of, of narratives that are, are similarly embedded in, in ritual. Um, you know, in, in, in my book, I call it first generation and second generation. Uh, first generation are really all uh, sacred narratives that are all rooted in ritual, uh, in theater, uh, in let's say local traditions of local gods. Uh, and these are all um, together, uh, let's say all these disparate elements are woven into a bigger story. Uh, and <clears throat> of course, in the case of Feng Shen Yang, the canonization of the gods, what, what they tried to do is to uh, connect these local uh, traditions to the bigger sacred uh, mythical uh, history of China, the golden age of the, the Zhou dynasty, which is the, the dynasty in which Kongzi, Confucius uh, lived, uh, of course. So uh, there's that element, um, but it turns out at the end of the book, it offers, uh, it offers us, uh, you know, all the characters in the novel, the, both the good ones and the bad ones, if, if there's any such thing really, uh, they are uh, all given a position as a god um, uh, in a hierarchy, but that's important to realize, in a hierarchy of, uh, of gods, uh, higher gods and, and even higher gods that more or less belong to the purview of, of Taoism. And uh, as sets of gods that are being canonized that are given these, uh, these positions in that hierarchy, each distinct set represents a ritual tradition. So you would have a uh, ritual tradition related to thunder ritual, uh, related to uh, uh, certain rituals uh, that, that call the powers of the, of the stars. Um, you would have local traditions that are not not quite researched yet. There's a lot of a lot of things still to explore, but all of these they represent uh, sort of local traditions that are probably um, not just in some uh, theatrical tradition that we can more or less uh, that we can more or less uh, trace back, um, or also not just in in some kind of uh, narrative to tra narrative tradition that may be told by oral storytellers, whatever, but probably. Um, again, relates to these, uh, to these, um, let's say militias, um, or otherwise you call them, you call them sorcerers. Okay. Uh, I, I prefer to call them ritual masters and these ritual masters, they surely also did, uh, uh the training or they were involved in the training of, of militias. Um, so, so these, these, uh, these ritual traditions, they would basically um, be, be based in, uh, or, or the narrative would be based in these ritual traditions uh, tied to localities. Uh, and again, they represent this whole complex of, of, of uh, theater, of narrative, of religious worship, of uh, Taoist or other ritual, etc. So again, you know, coming back to, to what, you, what you were talking about in the beginning, uh, it's it's always a, a complex that leads to another complex. Um, did did I answer the question? Yeah, 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 yeah. Good overview. Uh, so so who is who is Naja? Who is Naja or Naja? Well, that you would have to uh, to ask uh, Mayor Shahar, of course, who published a book on that, uh, the the Oedipal God. Mm. Um, well, N Naja is a god who who comes from a Buddhist background. He was uh, a Buddhist, um, a Buddhist, yeah, divinity from, uh, from India. By the way, this, uh, if you don't mind me going back to something else you said earlier about uh, um, either the graduate student you interviewed uh, yeah. or Elizabeth Perry, um, uh, you said there, were, there was always a bodhisattva involved. In, in their training, uh, so I, I, this is something you know. One of the one of the things that I like to talk about, you know, the term pu sa is you know that's the Chinese equivalent for bodhisattva. But but really, uh, by many people, even or maybe especially today, 
uh, it is used as a blanket term for gods. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't necessarily have to be a bodhisattva if they use the term uh, prusa. Anyway, that's just a, a, a digression. Mm -hmm. um, so back to, to Nojan, he's uh, uh, rooted in, in, in an Indian or an Indic uh, Buddhist background, but became also absorbed in these vernacular uh, martial uh, exorcist rituals where he was, uh, he was transformed, uh, I would say, into um, a very ambivalent figure. Because on the one hand, if you look at the iconography uh, of, of Naja in, you know, either today in these temple festivals in, uh, in Taiwan, you will see there's always a figure jumping along, uh, carrying a huge head uh, with, a, with a cute baby face. And that cute baby face that is Nota. So he's on one of the baby god. Uh, also, even in Feng Shen Yan Yi, you read that he is uh, quite beautiful. He's a beautiful boy after he's born. But of course, he's born in a very inauspicious way. Uh, and he's immediately um, labeled as a demon, as a demonic figure. Uh, his father calls him that. Uh, there's other, uh, other figures who, uh, who call him that. So he's cute, but demonic. Um, and this becomes, so this, 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 this becomes a, a very important leader of the five camps, uh, a very important, um, in fact, figure, even in uh, the protection of sacred spaces that are not necessarily related to the five camps. For example, uh, I, I don't know if I mentioned this in, in my book, there is uh, a scholar uh, originally from Hong Kong, uh, Chan Hok Lam. Yes, who, yeah, it's in your book. Yes. <laughs> okay, so so he, he has this. Uh, uh, he has a picture in in his book about uh, the city of the, the origin of the city of Beijing. And he has a picture where there's an outline of Nerja, um, basically representing all the cardinal points of the original city of of Beijing. So the city is an embodiment of Nerja, which to me was uh, really quite amazing to uh, to see that um, uh, and of course you know the reason that he's so this is the origins of, of Beijing are basically the the Mongol origin uh, origins and these Mongols they also worshipped uh, uh, Buddhism uh, uh, you know Tibetan Buddhism so there's this Buddhist link through which Nota was already present in in the north yeah I I, I don't you probably don't know this but I my uh... <laughs> I should have dropped this on you before. This is actually my book. Oh, wonderful. Oh, uh, great. Oh, I didn't see that. Yeah. Um, and uh, <laughs> you should hold up your book too. I'll, I'll put links, of course. Uh, and and uh, so what I argue is that is that uh, Bagua Zhang um, is a dance of Naja. And that, that, that you know, that the the sort of the, the supposed founder in you know the founder is, isn't described until after the boxer uprising but there's a tomb there's a, a tombstone that says he had you know hundreds of students um and they describe it that way but i, I believe he was he was some kind of uh performer of okay. eunuch a performer of, of the Naja ritual and and obviously uh uh, uh a function uh, uh, uh you know a uh what do you call it? a fashu? Um, okay, okay, great. Of some kind. Um, when when and, was this? Well, in in, in the eight, 1850 to somewhere between 1850 okay. and 1900. Mm -hmm. He died. He died maybe 1870s or 1880s. Um, okay. But that that that's the the origin of Bagua Zhang, and that he the I, all of the iconography um, matches. With the Naja story and the movement, so I'm really into this. Where you went into looking at literature, right, oh, yeah. as as this thing that needs to be then connected to all the religious cosmology and and to the actual living practice. I was doing the same thing with movement thing. Okay, this, this movement stuff actually has iconography. It has a story behind it. Um, at, we, we know in the Boxer Uprising that, that uh, people possessed by characters from Feng Shanyani, including Naja, were the vanguard. 
or at least right. their accounts. Okay. Like oh, that's that. great. I'll, I'll, I'll have to buy your book. I, I didn't know all this. That's <laughs> I'll great. send you a copy. <laughs> okay, yeah. I, I welcome that too. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so anyway, I just thought since you brought that up, that that definitely is part of it. The other the other things there was uh, um, he, this martial art as well as Xingyi uh, were closely associated with um, caravan guards, and they their patron saint, as it were, is also Naja. Uh, so okay. they had low, low, small temples to Naja for mm -hmm. um, opening the road, as it were. Oh, that's great! How did you find that out? Reading. <laughs> just reading books great wow <laughs> taking that's, notes that's, that's amazing that's really amazing yeah yeah i thought you'd like that i thought you'd like that uh, uh I, there's a lot more to ask you um you've been do okay let's jump right to your latest research because it's such fascinating stuff um you've been you've been working in in uh hunan uh have you been you've been in hunan yeah during many research? times many times yeah many. yeah yeah uh, and uh, and you you found a couple statues full of talismans. You want to talk about that a little bit? Sure, sure. Well, uh, I I uh, I didn't. I mean, yes, I found them, but uh, it's not something for which I deserve the credit because okay. <laughs> uh, the person who introduced me to uh, to Hunan, uh, he is actually a major collector and also. Uh, uh, scholar of these statues. His name is uh, Patrice Fava, course, so he's yeah. French. Yeah. And uh, he, we, we are very good friends uh, after he uh, introduced me. So the first time I went to Hunan in 2004, <clears throat> uh, the reason, I mean, these, this is how these things are all connected. He has right? a film, uh, right, about Han Chan, I think. Yeah. That's right. Uh, uh, and he, he invited me to join him on, a, on an expedition to, to Hunan because he had read a paper of mine that I wrote as a graduate student, which was about thunder ritual. Uh, and the rituals that he saw being done in Hunan uh, were very similar to the rituals that I was writing about uh, for the period of, of, of three, 400 years earlier. So that's, that's the original connection. And, but he had been, um, he, he had been collecting statues uh, from that region uh, since the 1990s. And the reason he found these Taoists in Hunan is also because uh, the, the little slips of paper uh, that these statues have inside, they usually, uh, I mean, not all, not all of them, uh, and not all of them are complete, but usually they would state where the statue is from. E even if it is 200 years, 300, 400 years ago, uh, they, would, they would state very clearly where the statue is from. So that's why he decided to go there. Uh, and found, I think he was really the first one to find to find these living uh, traditions of, of Taoism and, and other local traditions. So uh, I, I just went with him the first time and, and actually we've been going together uh, quite a few times afterwards. Um, so, you know, I've, I've been going on my own, but, but I, owe, I owe a lot to him, Patrice Fava. And um, so in the article that, that you're referring to, uh, so that's, that's something that is really, um, I mean, unbelievable and also a stroke of luck in a way because I bought uh, several statues myself after uh, joining Patrice to, uh, to Hunan. And uh, I bought a statue in 2007, for example, and I was just graduating from, 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 uh, from graduate school and uh, on the move, so I decided that a number of these statues that I had bought, uh, I will put, I will ship them to my parents in the Netherlands, which I did, uh, and they were there for, for years. And a few years later, I bought more statues, and, and uh, I looked at one of the slips, and I, and I thought, hey, wait a second, I've seen that name before. Uh, and I thought, wait, that's one of the statues that I that I probably shipped to my parents. So I asked my parents to to open one of those, and they took out a slip. And yes, it was the same god. And then uh, they uh, then I I talked to Patrice, and he said, oh, but I have those statues too. So it turned out there were lots of statues of a, a local god that nobody had ever heard of. I mean, nobody outside the the locality. Uh, and this became a new focal uh, area. So I went back there uh, to see if we could find the region where this God belongs. Uh, and we did, and it was, there were temples, uh, there were 
uh, again, living traditions uh, associated with, with the God. Um, unfortunately, due to COVID, uh, you know, that part, my, my research on, on the living traditions has had to be suspended, but it's still, as soon as I can go back, I will, uh, I will, I will try to explore that. But, but anyway, again, an example, local divinity uh, related to lineages, uh, related to rituals, uh, with its own narratives, uh, and uh, an, extensive, an extensive tradition of talismans that basically would uh, allow ritualists to uh, both put in the power of certain gods in, into the statue of the god, uh, but also use these talismans to, for, for appropriating the power of the gods uh, in people, in homes, etc. So very interesting uh, living tradition. So so there's this there's this god who, who who this particular one he fights bandits and he gets exactly, he, yeah, exactly he's got a bit yeah. of a reputation how does he, he doesn't personally fight bandits he organizes militias right around most likely around some kind of thunder god tradition but whatever we don't have that so he's 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 doing this and then he uh he dies a somewhat dramatic heroic death and they make him heroic into a god death. right and then as a god, right, he goes into this hierarchy in the cosmology yeah. of Taoism, and he actually marries Lao Tzu's daughter. Th that's that's a different one. So oh, that's a different uh, one. <laughs> oh, sorry. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, the 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 one with the statues, I'm I'm just talking about. So he's indeed a leader of militias. Uh, but there's another one, the, the one who marries. Who gets married to the daughter of uh, Lao Tzu? That's Zhang Wulang. So Zhang Wulang is the patriarch or the, you know, the ritual ancestor of uh, one important or probably the most important local tradition of, of vernacular ritual, uh, the Yuan Huang tradition or the primordial emperor tradition, if you like. Okay. So, I mean, that's a fascinating story uh, where. You have another, he's also a child god, right? He's a, a, a little boy who um, apparently is orphaned. He's orphaned uh, at a young age. Not, he's not, he's not, uh, he grows up with his parents until a certain age, but then he's orphaned. And uh, he goes out when he is 12 years old, if I remember correctly, uh, in, in order to learn rituals from 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 Lao Tzu, from Taishang Lao Jun, the the deified, uh, the deified Lao Tzu, and uh, Taishang Lao Jun, the deified Lao Tzu, he never really allows Zhang Wulang to become well versed in anything Taoist. So uh, he tries to constantly give him uh, all kinds of tests and assignments that are extremely difficult. Uh, and because he's just a poor little boy, every time he bursts into tears and he wonders how. Uh, how he can uh, solve this problem, but also every time uh, Lao Tzu's daughter, uh, Titi, because she's charmed by the boy and she feels uh, sorry for him, so every time she helps him out. And uh, in the end, what happens is that uh, basically Gigi runs away with him and they get married. Uh, so she's in a bit, in, in a way, also a bit of a rebellious daughter. But anyway, uh, <laughs> Tai Sang Lao Jin has no... Uh, there's no way of, uh, of, of undoing the marriage. So they have established a relationship, right? So you have the Taoist ancestor who has now uh, sort of a, a son-in-law representing a local vernacular tradition. And the local vernacular tradition is thus literally wedded to Taoism, um, but is not Taoist. So it's never, they can never really become the same. They can never really become uh, uh, they can never really merge, but they are joined, right? So that's what the story, what the story really tells you. Now, I found that uh, very fascinating. That you know, wherever you go in Hunan, you will always find versions of this particular story uh, to connect their local ritual to uh, the Taoist, shall we call it the Taoist mainstream, something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's great. Uh, okay, so yeah, I conflated those in my head. I'm um, sorry, I didn't have time no to reread the whole thing. But let's, let's go back back to the this militia character. I just I wanted to get at a couple of ideas that you that you've written about. Um, so 
so there's this militia leader. He become he he moves. He does move into the hierarchy, uh, in, in and 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 uh, and there's all these other deities, or you could call them uh, demons, right? They're 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 essentially in in some way or another people who've died on the battlefield in heroic ways, but then or or in some other way, like for, through some kind of pain or something that doesn't allow them to be on the family altar. So they have to be fed, basically. Right, right, and so, right. and then they, they essentially become incorporated in this, this figure, this deity. Um, and you actually have that with all, you know, so there's a deity with all the deities inside. And right. this, is, this is essentially a structure for organizing militia. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so for me, that was like, wow, I've been looking for a narrative that, that would explain what Tai Chi is all the way through, you know, like, cause, because my, my explanation of the beginning of Tai Chi Chuan is it, it starts just like a Taoist ritual or just like Feng Shen Yani. It begins with Hun Tun and you, you get Da Yu or maybe right. something like this invoked and then, and then you get Jun Wu and then you get, um, John Sun Fung, and and then there's this story, and I'm like, where does the story go? But when I read that, I was like, oh, it's actually the physical embodiment of a whole list of deities. You don't necessarily need a narrative to hold it together. So that was my sort of revelation after reading your your paper. What, what, what do you mean? Sorry, I, I didn't get it. Uh, you say you say. Uh... It, it is the embodiment of, of uh, what, what do you mean? The... So when you're doing Taiji, you, you will mime okay. each deity one by one in, okay. in some kind of that's sequence. Great. Oh, that's very interesting. So that you are, and because a talisman, what is a talisman, right? A talisman is you actually, to write a talisman, you actually take all, become the deity in, in, in essence, in, in a, we should actually talk about this too, how you become a deity, but you become a deity and, and then you infuse the chi of the deity in the talisman. And then that, right. that's what goes into the statue. So when you're doing Taiji, you would be doing the same thing. That's my assumption. That's fantastic. That's really, a, that's a, 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 major, a major new idea, I think. That's great. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah. I got it from you, so hey. Um, uh, the, um, uh, here we go. Okay. so. Maybe you could say something about, I, I thought this might be an interesting way to, to, to talk about what happens. So I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I don't know, some late, early Qing, late Ming dynasty. I'm like a peasant and I'm gonna go into battle. Um, what, what kind of process do I go through and what, what is the cosmology around me? And then I die, what happens? Could you, could you do that? Could you just give a like a sort of a scenario? Uh, well, I mean, this is just really speculative because there, there's no there's no um, clear records on it. You know, um, you know, piecing things together um, male, you know, m male figures uh, of a certain age, let's say 16 years and older, I think that's what traditionally counted as, uh, as an adult. So they would, you say a farmer, right? Or a peasant, well, so they would be that on the one hand, of course, um, but they would also be involved in other things. Uh, and when it comes to religion or, or, or um, let's say, the, the maintenance of, of the local cult, whatever, visiting temples, actually that would be mostly the task of women, uh, probably to a large extent. Women would uh, go the, the, the first day of the lunar calendar and then the 15th day of the lunar calendar, they would do these small rituals, uh, bring small sacrifices uh, and males would be at the side, uh, occasionally be asked to participate, but they wouldn't do much of that. But uh, in times of war, they would probably um, still find that they are connected to the temple, uh, and they. But but again, this is this is really very speculative. I, I imagine 
that many of them would actually be connected or part of these groups uh, that, that are militias. Um, it, you know, when, when, when I read these sources about mobilizing local militias uh, in the late imperial times, uh, these are fairly big numbers. Uh, they would sometimes describe uh, a few hundred people from a certain region, a few thousand. Uh, in many regions combined, you would have tens or even hundreds of thousands of, of, uh, of young men. So uh, clearly, there must be a significant percentage of, of people who were involved in this, but, but it's impossible to say what, what kind of percentage. Um, <clears throat> but so you would have people who then uh, were familiar with the procedures, they would be familiar with uh, the, the practices. If you read the, the Shrey Khudran, the, the water margin, so that, that must have been, I mean, I, 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 I cannot imagine that it's, that it's not connected to these militias as well. Um, they must have been sort of models for, for, for local groups, uh, you know, how to organize themselves, uh, how to name themselves, uh, even some strategies are probably taken from, from those uh, stories. Uh, and I imagine that, you know, these youngsters, they, they, would, they would know that. They would know the stories either uh, by seeing them performed in theater or uh, by uh, uh, maybe by just uh, people repeating the stories, but they would certainly carry them out. They would certainly practice uh, the kind of stories that you read about in those, in those novels, right? They would certainly practice them. Uh, I, I, yeah, I think that, that's what it must be. So, and then they would be called to war uh, and they would be under, under the command of a ritual specialist, uh, call him a sorcerer if you like, uh, call him a fascist, who would at the same time be able to uh, invoke the powers of a god uh, and summon them down and also probably work with these militias who most likely, most likely uh, were also in trance. So they were possessed by, by the gods, most likely. Um, but th that's as much as I dare to speculate. Well, so there's a couple of things. They may have been paint. Some of them we know were painting their faces, right? Right, right. Um, there were also two major type categories of ritual, right? One were sworn brotherhoods, they were doing some kind of, or blood swearing, right? Um, uh, and the other were invulnerability rituals, right? That would have been extremely common, yeah? Both of these. Yeah, yeah, definitely, um, yeah, definitely. And then, there, and then there, the flags and banners also somehow right. are, are, are ritual, have a ritual function in, in carrying the gods or somehow Absolutely. holding the gods down or something like that, yeah? Okay, so... I, and these these, these yeah, painted faces, if you don't mind me interrupting you. Yeah. So these painted faces, uh, you know, when I was uh, when I started to study that stuff, I I, I always felt uh, there was not enough attention. Uh, you know, some people mentioned it here and there uh, in passing, but there was not enough attention devoted seriously to uh, understanding a connection between the painted faces you see in these temple processions and the painted faces you see uh, in Peking opera, in, in Kunchi, you know, all these traditional theater uh, performances. And so that's something that I really uh, wanted to draw into it. Um, but then I still thought, you know, other than the sources that we have from, let's say, Song Dynasty uh, soldiers painting their faces uh, and, and some, some later, um, in, in the world as we can witness it now, I, I've only seen it in, in Taiwan, but later I, I realized um, in Hunan they do it too. You know, you have uh, people with different style, but still the the same basic pattern where demonic figures usually, uh, usually figures serving a god are painted with uh, white, red, and black, uh, and you know sometimes green, but it's basically white, red, and black in this you know similar patterns. Uh, you know sometimes refined, sometimes crude, but yeah, you find you find that. Uh, at least all over southern China, I would say. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, we should mention Avram Boretz's book. Um, right, yeah, definitely. God's Ghosts and Gangsters. 
uh, where he tried to to lay this out. Um, uh, um, uh, Daniel Amos also did some interesting research. I don't know if you know his work. It, it, he he there's a he has a book coming out, but he both Avram Boritz and and Daniel um, uh, Daniel Amos um, left academia after doing their initial dissertation. So right, um, yeah. But that's probably because they covered martial arts and it, the subject was just too controversial. I suspect. Really? Why, why would that be? What, 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 how is that a reason to uh, quit? Uh, it's not a reason. It's just a time thing. It had to do with the era. It had to do with what they could accomplish, I think, or what they, okay. I don't know. That would be, I would have to ask them. That's my guess. That was just my guess. Um, the, uh, <laughs> yeah, we need more of that. Anyway, that's just my opinion. <laughs> um, uh, uh, okay, so masks uh, or painted faces. Um, uh, so I die on the battlefield. Um, I've accumulated some merit, right? <clears throat> Would right. you be called Kung Fu? Or something well, like that? Uh, Kung Fu. Kung is certainly a part of it. it. Can be kung fu, but I, I would say most commonly is more kung de. So uh, the the virtue, you know, de is another strange word. It means virtue, but it also means power, right? So the yeah. power of of uh, of kung, uh, of merit, if you like. Um, so yeah, so you, you have that, and 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 so these these people that die on the battlefield, um, in a way, they're always meritorious, right? Simply because they decide to, uh, to uh, dedicate themselves in the service of somebody else or their community uh, and sacrifice themselves. So it is always meritorious, regardless of whether uh, somebody else may see them as enemies, right? So you do that <clears throat> and it's always meritorious and uh, because you die unnaturally, so your powers are still uh, unable to, to, dis to dissipate and to, uh, uh, or to, to be diluted, right? So they remain concentrated. Uh, and so something has to be done. And, and like the, the God, the, the Hunanese God who was fighting bandits, he too uh, had to be brought into a form or into a format where uh, on the one hand, he wouldn't pose a threat, right? Uh, because his powers remain undiminished. And on the other hand, he could still be allowed to apply his, his, his meritorious forces uh, for the benefit of of the community, so yeah, that that's something <laughs> I I really find always very uh, fascinating. I, so, I, I like so that. a rich some ritual was done, and and that and you you've argued that 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 ritual is actually in Feng Shen Yani. Well, uh, I'm not sure that the ritual is in there, but it certainly is. It it works as the f I, yes, I think it works as the framework for for um, for understanding the the story. Uh, what people, what people um, probably did with the story in some ways is to, to, um, to show that this is possible, to show that uh, this is how things could be done, and also to explain what you see around you, those rituals with these demonic figures, uh, usually, you know, given a position as marshal or general or whatever, uh, that these are similarly um, souls who died in battle uh, and did meritorious deeds simply by by doing battle you know and also uh, let me see if i got this right so they they basically you're 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 kind of a demon when you die because you're just you're this ling right all this potential power right martial power which could be the cause of future violence Right, they, they, it's sort of this idea that they might jump into a snake and then the snake would go into a tree. And so then you have this whole cosmology that you described of, of um, thunder gods, like sending lightning into trees to kill snakes, which are in a sense, these wandering ghosts or this, this energy. And so that's actually where the thunder gods get their, their energy is by enlisting all of these wandering um what is a gongda right um to become part of a hierarchy right right well i, I don't think that's where they get the energies of thunder gods but certainly where they can accumulate their merit after 
having become a, a thunder god. That that's definitely true. Yeah. I see. And and then and then they they kind of work up. Maybe they work their way up the hierarchy over time. Yeah. Right. Right. So it's kind yeah. of I died on the I I'm going into battle and I think well if I die I'm going to become a deity. It'll be a low deity for a while, but then I'll get to work my way up. Is this sort of, you think the mind well, of a peasant? Well, that I do not dare to say. I I I, I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe, 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 maybe. Um, I think nobody really would like to die. Uh, and nobody really would like to die a death that would be, uh, well, premature, right? Uh, with all the consequences. But maybe, yeah, who, who knows? Who knows? I, I, I try to be, uh, I, I prefer to be cautious there, but maybe you are right. It's possible. I, I mean, I pose the question mainly because I think that a lot of people listening to this will be thinking, um, well, I know about Christian martyrs and Muslim martyrs. What, what's going on? How, how are the Chinese different? You know, that's kind of why I posed it that way. Yeah, no, I understand. And you know, it, again, it is really possible. Um, it is really possible. And in a way, if you, you know, if, if we connect, let's say, Feng Shen Yan Yi with uh, Shui Hu Zhuan, the water mm -hmm. margin, mm -hmm there is certainly a kind of ideal uh, that emerges from those from both of those stories uh, that fits what you are saying um, you know I, 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 I can see that um, but well maybe no but it's just that I, I, I have never read any uh, sort of statement to that effect that that I would feel comfortable uh, affirming it, but I can completely imagine it. Absolutely, no. Yeah. Um, so, uh, Shuihu or uh, mar water margin. So, you have this great thing about there. They all become stars. Right. Uh, right. Could you explain that a little bit? What the what the cosmology is there? You have all these bandits, and they have, they they're all really bad guys. I mean, I, yeah, I think you could explain the whole cosmology pretty quickly. Um, well, I'm not sure they're bad guys. Some of them, I mean, they're violent guys. They, yeah. th this is the thing, right? They, they know that this is something that on the one hand seems to be very contradictory with Taoism, for example, uh, because Taoism, if we, if we just focus on the, the classical text, Taoism is something that uh, seems to disavow anything that is violent or even purposefully uh, directing energies at something. So on one hand, that seems to be in contradiction with it. On the other hand, uh, the way that this kind of violent, this idea of violence uh, fits with Taoism is that it is also a skill, right? It is a skill that is uh, perfected uh, by doing it often, by practicing a lot. You can perfect a certain skill and you become so good, you become so good at it that uh, uh, it might even be developed into a fa shu, right? Uh, a ritual method or, you know, uh, you know I, I, I translate fa with, with, with ritual, but it, it, it can just be, uh, let's see. Oh, we, let, we have the term fa, fa chuan, fa shen, all the very common terms in, in, China, in martial arts, for sure. Right. Yeah, and what I want to say is, you know, the term fa is applicable to so many things uh, th that somehow are all very similar. Namely, it is a, a, a form of disciplined action, right? A form of disciplined action. Uh, and that, that is often violent also, um, or at least it represents some form of violence. I mean, I don't know how you think of uh, Tai Chi Quan, um, which is very not violent, but at the same time, it seems to also embody certain uh military ideas right well i this is something i've been working on with marnix wells um that that we've been doing a we've been looking at the taiji classics and where they come from when they're written about the 1850s and so you have th this text um that is clearly Taoist. uh it's clearly describing golden elixir as a process of of uh, uh, that you would that you would do in order to to get you know, great skill. Um, and, uh, and, and it says, you know, you'll have this, you know, if you do this practice, you'll have this Dongjin, this like uh, revelation of power, you know, sudden 
and it'll, it'll permeate you. It'll be tong, you know, everywhere. Um, and you will become Shun Ming, right? Which you could even say is a star. You know, like that actually that's sort of the beginning of the Tai Chi classics says this. Um, and then, you know, and then, and then it's actually quite comic, you know, it's sort of making fun of a lot of the Confucian classics and then saying, you know, making it, making the Confucian classics sound martial. Sound like they're about <laughs> okay. fighting, stuff like that. So it's, it's, um, it's very playful, actually. Um, Which is also very Taoist, right? I mean, sorry to, to uh, always bring him back to that, but uh, in, in drums already, uh, uh, Zhuangzi has a very playful attitude towards uh, Confucius. Uh, on the one hand, he, he disavows a lot of the uh, dogmatic ideas, but he, he disavows them often in a very uh, humoristic and, and, and playful way. So I, 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 see that, I see that parallel if you don't, uh, if you um, don't mind. You, you have this wonderful essay which, where, you, where you take um, three types of uh, manifestation you might say manifestation of of the thunder god of Le Legong, right. uh and and link it to Zhuangzi. do you want to can you lay that out quickly what are the three um well that's difficult uh, that's really difficult um I, I i i link it ultimately to what what is important to me uh in those three stages is that uh they basically represent three modes of perceiving uh, the world. And one is, uh, the, for us as commoners, you know, supposedly uh, you and I were just common mortals and we perceive the world in very simplistic terms. So we see a God and we think of uh, it as a power over us, right? We see it as uh, some, some subject that has power over us as object. Mm -hmm. um, and if you are a little bit more uh, versed in, uh, let's say, uh, the ritual traditions of, of, of China, you could have already a different perspective. So most of the, the vernacular traditions, they reverse it more or less. And they, they say, well, actually, you can look at those gods as objects that we as subjects can have power over. Uh, so that's an, sort of an inversion. But then there's the third and what I think is the most Taoist way of thinking about it. But the third mode of perception, which is to uh, understand that uh, these uh, are neither objects nor subjects, and so and we are not either, uh, but that we are connected, right? And uh, if we have the right kind of uh, uh, let's call it again disciplined action, if you if you like, uh, we can establish or reestablish or no realize I think realize is the best word for it because it means a, a mental breakthrough but it also means to make something real right mm -hmm. so we we can realize the the umbilical connection that that exists between us and that is something that that Dronza, uh talks about a lot where um, he shows in different ways from different perspectives uh, using different images and different, uh, strategies, but he over and over shows that uh, that we as human beings uh, are wrong or, 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 or are in a lower kind of truth uh, if we think that we are just objects in a world uh, atomic and disconnected from each other. I think that, that is really a, uh, what is important. And this is important in Taoist ritual, which really tries to uh, also realize these connections. So Taoist ritual uh, in, in much of its core uh, ideology or practice, whatever, really tries to realize this, this connection between, uh, to me, between me and something else and to break through the disconnection, to break through the separation that we feel. No. Oh, that, that really well-known examples from the Chuangzi one is, is that uh, he dreams he's a butterfly and then the butterfly dreams that he's Chuangzi and Chuangzi dreams he's a butterfly and he doesn't really know. He, and, right. and, and I think you said uh, you, you, can't, um, you can't actually solve this with language. It's an experience. Right. right. Yeah. And, and, and another one is the fish, or the, his argument with his best friend over whether or not the fish are happy. And he finally right. says, let's return to the origin of things Right, um, right. I know the fish are happy. 
as me right standing here <laughs> I can just... exactly. that's that's it yeah. that's it yeah. yeah and this is uh, to me drums is so simple uh um i mean of course yet still so difficult to explain but but uh like you if you do uh if, you, if you're so serious in in uh you know trying to understand these chinese traditions uh then it is easy to understand right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah I, I, but but i think for most people this would be extremely difficult to explain i don't, I don't know if this is something that you try to use uh drums as ideas uh you know as a as, uh, yeah, I, well, I, I mean, so, you know, the, this, this, there's this hand gesture you see in, in the tai, in Taiji, I mean, and it means a butterfly, right? So it's, it's, oh, I don't know that. Oh, great. Yeah. And so, I mean, nobody else says this, but that this is from Kunchu. It means a butterfly. And I said, when I, when I learned that about Kunchu, I said, oh, well, there it is in the Taiji here. He's waking from a dream. And then you have Johnson Fung putting on his coat, you know, and then putting on his oh, really? hat. And combing okay. his beard, and, and so I was like, "Oh, this is, this is just, this is just obvious mime." Once you understand the little the little pieces, you're like, "Oh, it just fits together perfectly." So I think that 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 um, uh, when you really talk about the importance of theater and the idea of what's fake and what's real as as dominant um, tropes in the theater. Um, Chuangzi is central to 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 um, how people understood what theater was. In fact, um, you know this 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 window into the realm of the dead. You might say <laughs> something yeah. like that. Yeah. Uh, I I heard a great paper um, when I was in France. Uh, this guy was just he he just so you were you were you were breaking up you were breaking oh, up. I. I, I heard a paper delivered. I can't remember who the guy was, but it was it was when I was in uh, in Paris um, at a Taoist conference, and he was just he was talking about Kafka, and he said he was going through all Kafka's letters and stuff, and he realized he'd been he's obsessed with Zhuangzi um, right oh. before he wrote Metamorphosis. Oh really? Okay, interesting. And so you know, obviously he just flipped it upside down and made it about turning into a cockroach and realizing he couldn't tell if he was a cockroach or not. Um, so, oh really? Oh, I have to reread that story. That's interesting. That's interesting. Yeah, it's so pretty. Actually, funny. So there's actually uh, evidence that Kafka was reading drums when yes. before or during. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Really? solid evidence. Yeah, he's in his letters. Okay. He's talking about it to to his friends. Oh, fantastic! Wow, that's amazing. I. I have to uh, read more about that. That's great. I just thought I thought you'd appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah, um, absolutely. Oh, let me see what else. <laughs> I, I have to very soon. Uh, uh, I, I said I have to prepare, but I realized my my wife. Uh, she's teaching also. She needs this room. What does your uh, wife in, teach? In uh, fifteen minutes. Sorry. Okay. What does your wife teach? Chinese history. Oh. Wow. You are a power couple. Well, I wouldn't say I wouldn't say it like that, but uh, we're a couple, all right. I, I, I. Okay, you've done a wonderful job of condensing my hundreds of questions. I really want to thank you for that. Um, are do you, can you say anything about your plans for the future? Are you going to stay in Hong Kong? Um. Well, for the for the moment, there's no uh, uh, no real reason not to. Mm -hmm. So uh, that that's one thing. Another thing is that I have a, a very, um, how should I say, a research project that I'm very deep into uh, that also involves going to Hunan. Uh, so I, I, I'll still have to go back a few more times. And uh, for the moment, that's uh, uh, that's keep that's going to keep me here. Yeah. I, are are you are you working with other? There's I, I guess uh, David Palmer's there too. Are you working with other right. other scholars there? Is there any? Yeah, David and I we are in touch uh, quite frequently and also uh, involved in 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 uh, in some things together. Uh, there's Ver Allen, uh, Francisco Ver Allen. He's here. Oh, he's uh, there too. Lai Ji team. Um, hopefully, I'm not forgetting anybody. Uh, oh. Uh, uh, um, um, Timothy Chan, who, who does uh, 
uh, Taoist literature. Um, yeah, there's there's quite a bunch quite a bunch of people working on these things. Yeah. So it's a it sounds like a pretty great place right now for that. It is. It is. It is. I mean, Hong Kong is always a, a very interesting place to be. Um, and you know, as I'm looking out, I'm looking out of my window. Uh, we I see great green mountain uh, in front of me. Hong Kong is very green, something that most people don't know, uh, but it is extremely well preserved in terms of uh, nature. So yeah, yeah, love it here. Well, um, I do hope we get to talk again. I, it was really wonderful, and I really it was a, it was a pleasure. It. Really, I, I really enjoyed it. Uh, you uh, you put me to the test. Uh, I, I hope I passed. <laughs> Indeed, you did. You did. <laughs> I um, yeah. Thank you again. Uh, and and uh, we'll be in touch. Okay. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Hey, if you like that video, don't forget to subscribe and watch the other ones. Also, check out my book. Tai Chi, Bagua Zhang, and the Golden Elixir, Internal Martial Arts Before the Boxer Uprising. And you can also find me at northstarmartialarts.com. Thanks.